In this lesson, we'll cover the basic process for one of the two types of questions you will encounter in the verbal reasoning section of the GMAT Focus Edition, and that's going to be critical reasoning prompts. So first off, there are going to be approximately 10 individual critical reasoning prompts and tasks in your 23 question verbal reasoning section. So this is a little less than half of the section. You generally will experience more reading comprehension, but each of these are going to be self-contained little passages of information pertaining to a single question stem. They also can be potential content for data insights, two-part analysis questions as well. Strategically, you want to spend about two and a half minutes per question on critical reasoning style problems in the verbal reasoning. This is a little bit more time per question than the reading comprehension. And the reason for that is the details here matter materially. So you really have to pay attention to little subtle term shifts and the details and the qualifiers and the quantifiers, because those often lead to the right answer. You also want to assume about three minutes per question for the data insights, two-part analysis, critical reasoning format slides. And once again, that's going to be a little bit longer than the average within the section. You'll have a hard maximum of three minutes for any individual verbal reasoning, critical reasoning style question, and a hard four-minute maximum for any data insights, two-part analysis, critical reasoning task. You also want to hold yourself to a single reread before you move to eliminate, guess, and flag. So don't keep going back into the prompt because that's a real quick way to end up wasting too much time. And this is your primary format of question within the verbal reasoning section to guess, flag, and skip proactively if you're behind in pace. And that's true of the data insights section as well. If you're having trouble understanding what's happening in the little paragraph, rather than reading it over and over again, it may be in your best interest to take advantage of the feature that allows you to return in the GMAT Focus Edition to a problem that you've skipped and change up to three question answers. Now, the most important aspect of the critical reasoning is going to be the process of elimination. So if you've seen the reading comprehension lesson, this will be relatively familiar to you. First off, we know that if we put a check mark next to one of the answer choices, that is going to indicate that it is correct. And the metric of that being correct is that it matches the prediction you came up with for the argument task, strength and weaken, identify a flaw, something of that uh, kind. Or it simply matches the statements of fact in the prompt if it's an inference task. And we'll talk about that here in a moment as well. Now, an X means that it's incorrect and you can articulate specifically a common wrong argument or inference reason. We're going to see some really redundant ways that the exam makes critical reasoning answer choices incorrect. And you're going to want to identify and articulate what specifically makes a wrong answer wrong if you're going to use that X as part of your process of elimination. Of course, we also have some ambiguity within the verbal reasoning uh, process of elimination and answer choices. So sometimes you may find yourself just going, ah, kind of, maybe. And in that case, use the little tilde or squiggle. And that indicates that you cannot say 100% that it matches your prediction or the statements of act, or you simply can't produce a definitive reason that it's incorrect. And of course, we also have our question mark, which indicates that you truly can't define something. So you either don't understand the words that are being used in the answer choice, or it's like triple double negatives, and you're just confused by the way in which the answer choice is phrased, and you're not sure what impact it has, even though it appears to be relevant. So you might use that question mark. Now, strategically, we know that we prefer the question mark over the squiggle. That's the most important part of this order of preference. Obviously, you'll never want to select the answer choices that have an X next to them. Obviously, you should select the ones that have a check, no check mark next to them. But when you're down to two, remember that the question mark could be 100% correct were it properly understood, whereas by our metric of evaluation, we're saying the squiggle cannot be. So remember that when you're down to a question mark versus a squiggle, when you're choosing between something that you're familiar with but talking yourself into versus something that's completely baffling, choose the choice that is completely baffling because that may be how the exam is generating difficulty and they're taking advantage of the idea that 
we as a species, humans, we tend to default to choosing the thing that's familiar even if we don't believe it's correct simply because of that familiarity. Now, also allow two pass elimination by using the question mark or the squiggle on your first pass through the choices. If you have any doubt as to whether it's correct or incorrect, usually you'll be able to eliminate at least a couple answer choices for every critical reasoning <clears throat> question pretty directly. So you should be able to get down to two or three just by getting rid of things that are relatively obviously wrong. And when you're down to two, focus on qualifiers and quantifiers for definitive reasons to eliminate. So what that means are adjectives and adverbs. There's a very definitive difference between more and most, always and sometimes. Look for those qualifiers and quantifiers for definitive reasons to eliminate, and you'll take yourself to being on the path of getting the hardest critical reasoning questions correct because you're noticing those subtle details. Now that we understand how the check X squiggle question mark system works with critical reasoning, let's talk about some of those common wrong answer reasons, starting with argument wrong answers. First, we've got a vague impact. So that's going to be a quantity or quality with an unclear impact on the argument. So you've got to be aware of imparting meaning to words such as a number or some that isn't there. A number could literally be any number. Some could be any value over zero. So make sure that you're not putting in bias and turning a vague quantity or quality into something that's definitive because that ambiguity could be a reason to eliminate. You'll also have a reverse impact because if you're being asked to weaken an argument, there are often going to be answer choices that strengthen. and You have to guard against selecting something that accomplishes the opposite task. You'll also encounter answer choices that ultimately need additional information because they introduce some undefined variable that has an unclear impact as well on the conclusion. And lastly, we have an answer choice that definitively has no impact either way, whether it's true or false. And you have to consider both directions to make sure that you don't fall for traps that quote unquote seem out of scope but are actually very relevant if you apply them thoughtfully to the little paragraph and the argument it contains. And just in general, specificity in the choice can be an indication that it's likely correct, because when it's surprisingly specific, that can be an indication. This is the way that you have to very tactfully and directly properly affect the argument, whether it's strength and weak and identify a flaw, identify an assumption, or one of the other argument tasks that you may encounter. But you're going to have some different wrong reasons for our inference tasks in critical reasoning. And generally, they're going to be very similar to our reading comprehension inference wrong reasons, such as a reversal. So that's just simply an answer choice that states the opposite of the prompt. So you've got statements and you've got to find something that must be true following our rubric for inferences. And you find an answer choice that actually seems like it wouldn't be true or is the opposite of the information that's presented. You'll also, also potentially encounter things that are extreme that go beyond the statements of the prompt. So you've got a prompt that says occasionally this occurs. The answer choice says always this occurs. You can eliminate for that reason. And you'll also encounter answer choices that seem reasonable but aren't definitively true based on the statements of fact, and those can be categorized as possible but not certain. And we recall that inferences for the purposes of critical reasoning and by, extent, by extension the reading comprehension are statements that must be true without any exception based solely on the, information's, uh, on the information provided. So a uh, common wrong answer is something that seems reasonable but isn't necessarily definitively true. And when you're considering your correct answer for inference tasks, you actually want to select the vague statements that are accurate and do not go beyond the prompt. So let's take a look at how a critical reasoning style question will look on the left-hand side here. So we've got a standalone, a standalone scenario facts supporting a subjective conclusion to evaluate. In this case, we've got several brown foxes have recently been seen outside of Hay's chicken farm. As a result, Hay has decided to get a dog to protect the chickens, and that result is ultimately functioning as the conclusion. And then we get our question stem, which 
asks, which of the following statements, if true, best supports Hayes' decision? So there are many possible question tasks involving an evaluation of the conclusion and inherent assumptions of that conclusion. And in this case, we're just being asked to support Hayes' decision. And that decision, of course, was to get a dog to protect the chickens. Now, your five choices you must apply as true to determine a definitive impact as required by the task, in this case, to support Hayes' decision. The correct answer must be definitive, and the wrong answers are frequently going to be ambiguous or accomplish the incorrect task, and we can use those common wrong reasons we just discussed. So we introduce the answer choices, and we're trying to support Hayes' decision to get a dog to protect the chickens, based solely on the statement that several brown foxes have recently been seen outside of Hayes' chicken farm. So choice A, many farmers like dogs. Well, wonderful. Um, many kind of vague like dogs, well, we're trying to support the idea that he got the dog to protect the chickens, not just because he likes dogs. So again, we don't know if Hay is a farmer that likes dogs. We certainly know that the liking is not related directly to protecting the chickens, so A can be eliminated pretty directly. Similarly, choice B, some dogs hate foxes. Okay, wonderful. Does that help to protect the chickens? I don't know. And some incredibly vague as a quantifier. Choice C, all foxes steal chickens. We don't need all foxes to steal chickens. And we don't know that stealing is going to allow the dog specifically to protect the chickens. Just because foxes steal chickens doesn't necessarily mean that a dog reasonably is going to protect the chickens without making some other logical leaps. Now, choice D, most foxes fear dogs. Well, that hits on it directly. It says... Here is why the dog specifically will help to protect the chickens based solely on the information about the brown foxes having been seen outside of Hayes' chicken farm. Choice D seems pretty good. It gets a check. Then choice E, several breeds of dog are descended from foxes. This introduces this whole idea of like, okay, does these dogs being descended from foxes mean they're related in some fashion? I need additional information to parse that. Several is incredibly vague, so we can eliminate E and confidently select D for this sample little argument task, trying to find something that supports or strengthens an argument. So now the other type of major format critical reasoning question you'll see is going to be an inference critical reasoning, and those are just asking what must be. So we've got a similar but slightly different paragraph here. We've got several brown foxes have been seen outside of Hayes' chicken farm. Dogs have been proven by farmers to detour, deter foxes from stealing chickens. There is no conclusion here. There's no subjective claim or decision as there was previously. We just have a standalone scenario of facts to evaluate. And then our task is going to be some variation of which of the following is best supported by the statements above, which of the following must be true based on the statements above, which of the following can be logically inferred by the statements above, and that task is always going to be distilled down to what must be based on the explicit, explicit statements of fact provided by the prompt. Then we're going to have our five choices that we can cross-check against the statements of fact as either absolutely certain or absolutely impossible. And we're going to know that the correct answer is absolute. So it's something that has to be 100% definitively true. And your incorrect answers are going to be things that are possible only. So let's bring in our answer choices. Starting with choice A, every farmer should have a dog. We don't know anything about every farmer, so we can eliminate choice A. Choice B, dogs hate foxes. Uh, I don't know that. I'm uh, uh, imparting an entirely new concept of like their emotional disposition to the dogs. I can't make that kind of claim. Hayes Chicken Farm could benefit from having a dog on site. Well, we know that there are brown foxes that have been seen outside the chicken farm. Dogs have been proven by farmers to deter foxes, so having the deterrent would make it seem like it would be a benefit. And so that nice, vague, possibly benefit is 100% true. Not saying it definitively will benefit the chicken farm, but it could, so that seems reasonable. Then choice D, all foxes steal chickens. We don't know this statement about all foxes. We know several brown foxes have been seen outside, and that dogs have been proven to deter foxes from stealing uh, chickens, but we don't know that every fox does it. And then choice E, hay would make more money by raising cattle instead of chicken. 
Um, I don't know anything about making money. And this is the kind of answer choice where you have to just be careful of grabbing an answer choice that seems reasonable, but I don't know that. And I need outside information to make any sort of claim such as that. So we'd eliminate choice E pretty confidently and select C as the only thing that is definitively true based solely on the statements of fact. So step one, <clears throat> skip the prompt and read the question to determine your approach for the format, either an argument or inference style critical reasoning. Step two, if it's an argument task, read the prompt and note the almost verbatim conclusion that you are being asked to evaluate in some fashion pertaining to the task. For an inference task, you'll just read the prompt and shorthand note your statements of fact. Then step three, for argument tasks only, you're going to want to broadly predict what the answer should do to address the task. So for strengthen, I want to find information to strengthen the claim in the case that we had that uh, the hay should buy a dog to protect his chickens. Weaken, same thing, find a reason not to buy a dog to protect the chickens. And you can basically repurpose your task into your prediction just about every time for argument style critical reasonings. Then step four, we're going to do our process of elimination. We remember our common wrong argument answers, things that have a reverse impact, things that have a vague impact, things that require additional information to determine a definitive act impact, and things that truly have no impact, whether they're true or false, either way. And then for our common wrong inference answers, we're looking at things that are reversals of the information, things that are extreme based on the information, and things that are only possible but not definitively certain based on the information. So let's head on over to the whiteboard and see how we'll engage with both an inference and an argument task, a critical reasoning problem, when you have your scratch work to excel at this aspect of the GMAT Focus Edition verbal reasoning section. As always, we set up our scratch work first. So we've got A, B, C, D, E for process of elimination. We put a little line over top and we're going to read the question stem first. And we see the information in the passage most strongly supports which of the following. So if your direction of support goes down, then we know that you've got an inference task because the statements above support the conclusion below in the choices. So we can write this as just a what must be style question. And we're just going to have some statements of facts. So we're going to have fact one, fact two, fact three here. And if we need more facts, we'll add them in a moment. So starting at the beginning, matching marbling patterns of the past is an important part of what staff at the global publishing office do. Okay, so we've got our matching marbling important GPO work for global publishing office. Workers are often asked to recreate designs so that routine publications such as the Jefferson Manual look consistent from year to year. So we know that the GPO workers asked to match clubs from the past year. <clears throat> However, there are also publishing jobs that offer opportunities for plenty of creativity. So we know that there are other GPO pub jobs offer lots of creativity. And the reason that you want to take these notes, even though it is going to be a little bit time consuming, is to force yourself to engage with the information. Now, choice A, classic marbling pattern replication is the primary responsibility for global publishing office staff members. Well, that primary responsibility right there, we don't know that definitively. That's extreme. We can eliminate choice A. Then choice B, publication of the Jefferson Manual is an activity lacking opportunity for any creativity. Well, we know that it has to be consistent, but we don't know that it lacks any creativity, so we can eliminate choice B as being extreme as well. There is an extensive library of past global publishing office publications available to current staff members. 
okay, well, we know that the routine publications are supposed to look consistent from year to year, and they're being asked to recreate designs, and this is an important part of what the staff do. So without a library of past available uh, publications, it'd be impossible to do that. So if you recognize it, this must be 100% true for the other facts to happen. Now, choice D, a lack of creative responsibilities is a major impediment to hiring new qualified staff. I don't know anything about hiring new qualified staff based on these statements presented. And choice E, the cost for recreating marbling patterns is less than the cost for drafting entirely new patterns. While this may seem reasonable, it's not stated at all what the cost is for these different publications. <clears throat> so you have to be careful about applying outside knowledge because otherwise we could just say that this is possible but it's not definitively certain because the actual statements of fact never introduce the concept of cost for these publications. And our correct answer, of course, is C. So that's how you can engage with an inference task broadly. Recognize that the support direction goes down, that the prompt has to support one of the answer choices, and then you just have to make sure you stick to the facts as written very closely. So as we scroll on down, let's take a look at another example here. So this time we set up our scratch pad once more with our answer choices, A, B, C, D, E, put a little line over top, and we can see which of the following most logically completes the archaeologist's argument. Well, the argument here, that word means that we've got an argument task, even though it's a little bit strange. So we're going to read this, and then we've got to think about what we need to do to finish the argu argument based on the surrounding context. So starting at the top, archaeologist says, Artifacts comprised of bone, stone, and shells unearthed during a recent excavation of East Anacapa Island provide important information regarding possible interaction between the Anacapa people and the mainland. In particular, sharpened fishing tools made from white-tailed deer bones suggest that mainlanders may have used the island as a fishing ground since blank. So, we know that there has to be a conclusion here, and the conclusion is this subjective position of what is being suggested and what may have occurred. So you can find a conclusion often by the, identifying these sorts of subjective position terms. So the sense has to be my way that we're going to strengthen that, clue, that conclusion. So... We know that we're going to have a little PS for predicted strengthen. So we need to find info <laughs> to show that the sharp or sharpened fishing tools from We'll just call them WTD white tailed deer bones. Must mean that the mainlanders used EAI for East Anacapa Island to fish as a fishing ground. So now we've just got to find an answer choice that gives us a reason that we believe that the sharpened fishing tools from these bones means that the mainlanders came to East Anacapa Island to fish. So, choice A, no naturally occurring white-tailed deer remains have been found on East Anacapa Island. Now, with this, <clears throat> here's the issue. You may be thinking to yourself, well, what does that have to do with anything? Well, if there are no naturally occurring white-tailed deer remains on the island, well, then someone would have had to bring these white-tailed deer bones to said island. So this actually shows that it's not naturally occurring, these white-tailed deer bones being present. So this shows one fewer possibility. Or basically these white-tailed deer bones. 
And that would, by extension, strengthen the argument. Now, of course, you want to look at the remaining answer choices briskly, at least. Now, stone fishing tools have also been fear found near the excavation site. Okay, stone fishing tools, this needs additional information. Because we were talking about one specific type of fishing tool. I don't know if those stone fishing tools would have been from the Anacapa people. I, I got a lot more questions than answers there. Then, choice C, using carbon dating, clamshell mounds on East Anacapa Island have been determined to be greater than 200 years old. Okay, that's a whole new set of information that I don't know how that affects the fishing tools and the fishing ground conclusion that we had. The people of East Anacapa Island and the closest mainland are believed to have shared a common ancestor. Well, again, what they're believed to have done, what that common ancestor means for you know the purpose of this particular argument needs a whole lot of additional information. And then white-tailed deer are primarily herbivorous animals that have never been known to hunt fish. Okay, so the deer themselves don't hunt fish, but that's not the issue. So this really has no impact either way. Because we're not asking about the deer, like, hunting the fish. It's whether the deer bones were used as fishing tools. So we can confidently select A. And you can see the difference here between an inference task and an argument task. But the inference task, make sure you're sticking to the facts closely and only finding something that must be true based on them. For argument tasks, you need to consider the information in the choice as true and determine if it has the appropriate effect on the argument presented. So go ahead and practice your own critical reasoning style questions to improve at this very important aspect of the verbal reasoning section of the GMAT Focus Edition.